But what strikes me is there's clearly a spiritual aspect of this practice that is part of what has drawn me to it and excites me about it. And I'm not always able to talk about it. I don't necessarily use spiritual language in talking about it with clients or even with other colleagues. But to me, there's something uh, deeply spiritual that draws me to it and um, deeply spiritual about the process itself and that it, it, it's a process designed to give clients the opportunity to get at their best selves um, and for the professionals to bring their best selves to the table, which is to me um, in some ways the essence of spirituality. One of my favorite uh, phrases is from Lincoln's second inaugural address when he talks about the, the better angels of our nature, which is, uh, and actually I wish I could remember the whole quote because actually when you read the whole phrase that he uses, it really sounds like it's talking about a collaborative case. I mean, the, you know, the, the mystic chords of union shall again, you know, there's really a lot, some wonderful things in there, but that whole idea of the better angels of our nature, which in the original writing was uh, the guardian angels of our nature, and Lincoln changed it to better angels of our nature. And uh, that whole idea that there's something inside all of us that is so good and so pure that um, that we just need to awaken it and, and to find it in ourselves and, and to give our clients the space in which they might awaken that. Um, to me, that's as, as, um, you know, that it's as deeply spiritual as it gets, and that, to me, has really helped me in my um, spiritual life and helped connect my spiritual life and a professional life. The other part that has a spiritual element, huge spiritual element to it, and it's one of the things that I continue to be far more of a student than a teacher because I'm really starting to learn this and Stu has taught me more than anybody is just um, the letting go of outcomes piece. Um, and that, is, that continues to me the most difficult part of collaborative practice. I always think when they talk about paradigm shifts with collaborative practitioners, for me there's like a couple of shifts. I mean one of them was easy, one of them was really hard for me. The, the easy one was understanding that we really didn't need this level of conflict or need a third person to decide things for us. We could do it ourselves and, and, and reducing the conflict. That it sort of comes instinctively. Um, the part that doesn't come so instinctively is the idea that it's the clients themselves that are responsible for the outcomes and they don't need me to fix them or make it work for them or to be the hero. Because I think a lot of us are drawn to it thinking we're going to fix things. and I, you know, it's. Really, I, I get real anxious when things look like they're not going to get fixed, and I think I got to go in there and fix them. And and yet, I think the deepest and highest level of collaborative practice is when we really learn to let go of that. And as Stu always says, you know, if I'm sitting in a four-way meeting in the room and my gut's turning, that's about something else. You know, there's something else going on, and I and I know that that's true. And yet, that's really, really hard. Really hard to to just uh, to trust the process, to trust the clients. And to guide them and provide leadership, and not like we just sit back and sing kumbaya here. I mean, we really have. I like that phrase that you know, we're responsible for process, and they're responsible for outcome. And I take that responsibility very seriously. We need to cre help them create an environment where they can bring that to the table, and that's hard work. And you know, it's something where it's good work. So you know, we have to let go of that piece. But once we've done that piece, then what happens happens, and we don't have to to make it happen a certain way. Um, and what makes that hard for me to do, to let go of, even though I believe in that, is, you know, that, again, the usual people pleaser kind of hero thing that draws a lot of us in. But also, in a different way, just the excitement about the movement. Like, well, I want every collaborative case to be the greatest case in the world, and if I don't step in and make it that, then maybe it won't happen that way. Well, that's, you know, I, you know that's crazy too, but I mean, it's easy to get caught into that. I, um, the more cases I've done, and I'm thinking I've done maybe 200 cases now, the easier it is to let go of that piece and to make it clear to clients that, boy, they're, they're in this process by their choice only. They want to step out. That's, you know, that's really up to them. They, they should not be here as a favor to me or as a favor to the process or their neighbor or anybody else. And uh, the more we can keep that door wide open, they, I think the more their level of commitment is. Uh, I, but having done a few hundred cases, it's easier to let go. Hey, if this case doesn't work out in a collaborative process, I can let go of that. What is a challenge when we, we go out to communities and we have new people who just get trained in collaborative and they're excited about it and they don't haven't quite figured out how to get cases yet and, and there's this real struggle to try to explain it to people and then when they get their first case or their second case or third case, they, like me, 
our understanding will be so anxious and so much wanting it to work that it's very hard not to do that. And yet, that's not what the process is about. It's not about making it work. And uh, it, it, you know, what you teach people is that to some extent you have to treat your first collaborative case like it's your hundredth, as if it just didn't matter if it worked. I mean, it matters in a way, but it's not like something we can make happen. Uh, because I think otherwise, yeah, in, in some ways the, those first cases can be less satisfying because we're all, we're all human beings. We're, intent, we're inclined to try to control those more. And, uh, and when, as this process evolves and gets better and better and more spiritual, um, we'll do more and more letting go and uh, more and more kind of just guiding people in the parameters and, and, uh, and watching, watching people um, make the process their own and shape it in their own way. And as I try to, as I tell people, one of the things that, if there's one thing I'm the most proud of in, the, in our book um, is that the collaborative way to divorce is that it, it, we really tried hard to explain to people that this is a great process, but it's really a great process because of them. It's really about what they bring to the table. It's not magic that we do. I mean, we really can do a good job setting the stage for them, but um, the, the amazing collaborative cases I've had are because of what the people have brought to the table and have done things that I, I admire immensely. The courage they've shown and the ability to let go of their egos is, um, is pretty amazing and, and hard, hard work. I mean, I, you know, clients, you know, clients who will come in who are angry, even in collaborative cases, say, well, gee, you know, easy for you to say, how would you, how would you feel if your spouse had just had this relationship with this other person? How would you, you know, it's easy for you to sit and talk about you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, you know, and I, I, you know, if I was in these situations, I might be so full with anger and, and sadness that I might make all sorts of bad decisions. And I, and I could never blame anybody for doing that, but I would hope somebody would give me the opportunity to, to not do that. And so, you know, so I guess the converse of that is when I know how much people are in pain and to see them bring their best selves to the table is pretty, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And so um, it's hard not to see that, in a, for me, hard not to see it in a deeply spiritual way.